Good morning, Kara's family. Uh, I hope that you all had a blessed Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, I know that for many of us, it was a departure from the types of celebrations that we're used to in the past, but uh, I do hope and pray that you were still able to celebrate nonetheless. Uh, you know, normally I would have given a Thanksgiving message last week, but uh, since I was reflecting on this topic during the week leading up to Thanksgiving, uh, there are some things that came to mind that I want to share with you. Uh, not all of it involves the topic of thanksgiving or gratitude, but a good portion of it does. So uh, this message is maybe a little bit late, but uh, to me it's still the thanksgiving weekend, so hopefully that's okay. Uh, before I do that though, let me make a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, please keep in mind that uh, we are not having our Thursday dinner night out this coming Thursday. Uh, so you will not be receiving an email for that. But we will be having our second in-person worship service a week from today on December 6th. Uh, here is uh, a slide of our upcoming schedule as well as the address to Brad G's dental practice uh, where we're going to again hold our service in the parking lot outside of his practice starting at our normal service time of 10.30 a.m. Uh, we will again be providing a lunch meal after the service, so although you won't be receiving an email for a Thursday dinner this week, you should be receiving one with regards to placing your lunch order for this coming Sunday's worship service. So keep an eye out for that email. We haven't yet finalized which uh, establishment we're going to be ordering from, but we should be finalizing that in the very new, near future. And so please make sure when you get that email, to place your order for next Sunday's lunch by the afternoon of this coming Friday. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll be able to come out and join us as we worship together this coming Sunday. All right, uh, this morning, I want to speak on a passage of scripture from Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica. The city of Thessalonica is in the region of Macedonia, which is part of modern day Greece. Uh, the book of Acts chapter 17 indicates that Paul only spent a brief period of time there when he started the church in this city before he was then forced to leave because of the opposition that he faced there. But he continued to be concerned about the welfare of the believers in this church uh, who were having to face continued and intense opposition from very influential people in that town. And they were obviously very young in their faith and still trying to figure out how to orient their lives and navigate the difficulties of their situation in light of their newfound faith. Paul became so concerned at one point that he sent his helper and his dear friend Timothy to go and check on their condition, and Timothy did that and returned to Paul, uh, letting him know that the Thessalonian believers were continuing to remain strong in their faith, meaning that they were continuing to hold to the teachings that Paul had left them with. They were continuing to grow in their love for one another, and their faith had endured despite the persecutions that they were facing. Upon hearing this good news back from Timothy, Paul then penned his first letter to the Thessalonian believers in order to encourage them and exhort them to remain firm in the faith. And towards the end of his first letter to them, he pens the following three verses, just three very short verses, but I want us to look carefully at them this morning. Paul writes to the Thessalonian believers, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the early Christians in the Thessalonian church had it tough. Uh, they faced persecution from both the Romans and the Jewish authorities that were there. Uh, some of them experienced division within their own families over their faith. And for some of them, their unwillingness to belong to certain trade guilds meant that they could no longer earn their living using the skills that had generated income for them in the past. So this was some of the realities that they faced. And it had been like that from the earliest days when the gospel of Jesus was first preached in that city. 
The book of Acts describes how Paul and Silas nearly lost their lives when they first brought the gospel message there and how these two men had to escape from the city under the cover of darkness. But then, even then, Jews from Thessalonica went after them, hunted them down where they went to in the next city, and stirred up crowds there looking for them in the hopes that they could have them arrested and prosecuted, hoping that they would then be executed for inciting rebellions by calling people to maintain an allegiance to Jesus over that of Caesar. Later, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said that they welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering and that he brought the gospel to them in the face of strong opposition. So it had been very difficult uh, for Paul to plant that church, and it only got more difficult as time went on. Subsequent to Paul's initial visit and planting of the church, these young believers in Thessalonica continued to face increasing difficulties, including opposition from some of the most unlikely places. Paul mentions this in his letter when he writes to them saying, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. So the believers in the church were, were facing opposition, not just from the authorities, but from their own people or in other words, their neighbors. People that they knew personally personally had turned on them and were persecuting them, causing them to suffer because of their faith. That must have been an incredibly difficult time for them. Their friends had actually become some of their persecutors. But the Christians in Thessalonica didn't give up, and Paul commends them for their endurance and their perseverance. They didn't disavow the faith or hide away. Instead, they had been bold with their witness for God. And so Paul says, You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. So Thessalonica was one of the more difficult places for the gospel to take root. Uh, from the fourth chapter of this letter, we know that some of those in the Thessalonian fellowship had died, and that there were some in the church wondering, what happens to those who die before Jesus returns, and when could they expect his imminent return in order to rescue them from their sufferings? So, to people enduring these very hard times, and who had very hard questions because of it, Paul comes to the end of his letter and he exhorts them, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know, but as I thought about this, I don't think that I could have written those words to those people going through the kinds of circumstances that they were going through. But then as I sat with this for a little while, and reflected on it some more, it dawned on me that one of the reasons Paul was able to write these words with a clean conscience is because he himself faced even more dire circumstances in his life than they did for the practicing of his faith. Meanwhile, uh, we practice our faith, to be honest, with relative security and ease, which I believe has both good and bad consequences. Obviously, uh, it is good to live in a time and a place where we can practice our faith freely, but in these kinds of circumstances, it seems to produce a faith in people that's both fragile and unwilling to sacrifice. Having said that, I do think that there is a word for us in this passage today, because although we haven't been suffering for our faith per se, 2020 has been one of the worst years ever in recorded history for many people around the world. Nearly one and a half million people around the globe have now died from COVID-19, and another 18 million, possibly even more, are currently fighting it right now around the world. 
Our economy is struggling like we haven't seen since the Great Depression, and scores of people are out of work. Neither the election nor our political divisions seem like they are ever going to come to an end. Uh, the pain of racial and gender injustices seem to be a daily occurrence. Uh, normal schooling continues to remain elusive, and many of the practices of normal life that had partially resumed recently have now been taken away, including things like watching and playing many sports, uh, going to restaurants, and traveling. Even our sense of a traditional Thanksgiving was lost this past week, and it appears that Christmas and New Year's Eve celebrations might be on the chopping block as well. Well, you know this list as well as I do, so I, actually, I don't want to belabor the point, only to say that 2020 has not been a good year. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Does this apply to us? Is it, is it even possible? I, I guess what to me makes this seem impossibly hard at times are the ways in which the adverbs or some of the words that Paul wrote following the actions modify these actions. I mean, we can all rejoice at times and we can all pray and give thanks, but always, continually, in all circumstances, does God really expect us to give thanks for all of the horrible things that have happened in our lives? Are we to be thankful for the loss of a loved one, or for the loss of our jobs, or the loss of our earnings, or our savings, and our financial security? Well, short answer is, no, I don't think so. There is, though, in this phrase, good news to be had, if you look closely. If you look at the preposition found in the statement, Paul says that we are to give thanks in all circumstances. Not that we're to give thanks for all circumstances. I don't think God would expect people in Louisiana or in Central America or the Philippines or in many parts of California to give thanks for the recent destruction of their homes and their belongings. What I think Paul is communicating here is that he had learned something through all of the difficult circumstances in his life that he wanted the Thessalonians to understand in their current moment of trouble. And that is that you don't need positive circumstances in order to give thanks to God or to experience God's grace. Paul had discovered through the experience of living out his faith that he could be genuinely thankful when his words were received well and the gospel was spread, or when his words were rejected and he faced heavy opposition. He could be genuinely thankful when he was locked up and beaten and scorned by other people, or when he, or when he was free and healthy and admired. And, you know, we see evidence of this throughout the accounts of Paul's life and other portions of the New Testament. He is able to rejoice and he is able to give thanks in any and all circumstances. And my sense is that Paul is not speaking here about rejoicing and praying and giving thanks in the sense that these are things that we are to do nonstop every moment of our life, which quite honestly I don't think is really possible. I mean, can you rejoice and pray while you are sleeping? I don't think so, but I don't believe that is what Paul is getting at here. I believe Paul is speaking about the orientation of our lives and the direction in which our thoughts and our actions and our words reflect where our hopes and where we have placed our allegiance in life. I might use as an example the constancy with, with, with which we love our families or our spouses and our children. Uh, this doesn't mean that we spend every waking moment thinking about them. I mean, we still go to work, we still enjoy moments of entertainment, we still spend time with other people, but none of that diminishes our love for them. It's always there, and it affects just about every part of our lives, involving our decisions, our motives, and our plans. It is a constant in that sense. And I believe that Paul would say that in the same way, our love for God should operate in this kind of fashion, but that it should actually supersede even our love for our families. Not that you can't practice one without the other, because I believe God calls us to love our families, so the two aren't 
mutually exclusive. But our love for God should be the constant around which our life is oriented, always at work in our conscious and our subconscious minds, impacting our thoughts and our words and our actions. Having said that, there's work that I know that I need to do uh, in my conscious mind when it comes to uh, living out Paul's exhortation to rejoice and pray and give thanks. And since we're still at the tail end of the Thanksgiving weekend, let's spend a little bit more time focusing on the last of these exhortations to give thanks in all circumstances. As I've mentioned in some of my past messages, there are now numerous studies that have been done that have found a direct link between the development of gratitude in one's life and their subsequent experience of life satisfaction and overall happiness. You see, there, there's a tendency, a human tendency that we have to give thanks when things are good and to complain when things are bad. But according to psychologists, we would actually be much happier if we learned to change this pattern. One professor at Yale University by the name of Lori Santos has made a career out of studying happiness, and her research has demonstrated objectively that for most people, happiness does not come from changing our circumstances. Now, we might think that it will. I mean, do you ever find yourself thinking, well, I might just be one of the few exceptions to that case. But her studies have found that with few exceptions grounded in extreme cases of acute suffering, the data indicates that happiness ultimately comes from within, not from without. It comes from our intentionally changing our perspectives and reactions to our surrounding circumstances. And she's found that one of the most effective ways to do this is to focus on expressing gratitude. When we intentionally focus on gratitude, it actually winds up rewiring our brains. Now, I, I've always found this area of neuroplasticity an interesting one. And as I was doing more research on this during the week, I ran into an article that came out just this past week and that discussed how studies have recently shown that there is a connection between one's level of gratitude and one's level of giving. One quote from the article said, In recent years, we've learned through several scientific studies that there's a deep neural connection between gratitude and giving. They share a pathway in the brain and that when we're grateful, our brains become more charitable. Those who have more gratitude become more generous, regardless of their level of wealth or income. I believe this helps to explain situations in the Bible like the widow that Jesus pointed out at the temple who he said gave more than anyone else to the temple treasury despite the fact that she only gave a few copper coins that really didn't amount to much at all. Jesus looked at what she gave and he commended her because while everyone else gave a portion of their wealth, the widow gave all that she had. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth about an offering that he was collecting for the poor, he referenced the churches in Macedonia, of which Thessalonica was one of them, as an example of how generous they were. He says to the church at Corinth, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Apparently, Paul's exhortation to the church at Thessalonica to consistently offer thanksgiving and gratitude had an impact on the level of their generosity despite their meager resources and difficult circumstances. When Paul told the Thessalonians to give thanks in all circumstances, the word that he used in Greek that's translated as give thanks is the Greek word eucharisteo. Now you might recognize the root in that word because it's also in one of the terms that you'll sometimes hear for communion or the Lord's Supper, which is the Eucharist, which uh, does basically mean giving thanks. 
But the verb itself is interesting if you take it apart. Charis, as many of you may know because it's the name of our church, means grace and therefore implies something given. So taken literally, the verb to give thanks means to see the grace in something or to see something as the gift that it is, which is important in the practice of gratitude. Uh, let, me, let me do a little exercise with you to illustrate how I think this works in our lives. I'm going to show you a picture, and in this picture, I want you to find a specific image. It may not be easy, but if you focus and if you look intently enough, I believe you can find it. Now, since time is of the essence, I'm only going to give you 30 seconds to find it. If you can't find it, you can always come back later, rewind the tape, uh, pause it, and uh, take a look for it later on. Here's the picture. What I want you to do is find the mouse in this picture. You have 30 seconds. So, did you find it? Well, like I said, you can always rewind and go back and pause on that slide and look for it later. Uh, I thought of this little exercise because it reminded me of those I Spy games where you try to find certain items inside of a picture. Uh, kind of like the ones that you'll see in the children's book highlights the ones that are generally at uh, the dentist's office and which seems like a very welcome distraction while you're waiting for your appointment and then you open up the book and find that someone circled all of the hidden items and totally ruined it for you. Uh, in some ways, giving thanks or seeing the grace in something is somewhat similar. That's why, in some sense, I think we call the prayer before each meal saying grace. Because by doing so, we are, we're seeing the grace in the meal, in the provision that God has provided us. But I believe Paul would say that we shouldn't limit this practice to just meal times. We should be looking for the grace around us at all times, because it's always there, even in our most difficult moments, because God is always there. That, I believe, is one reason why it is Christ's will that we give thanks. Not just because it's the polite thing to do when someone gives you something as a, a social and verbal form of gratitude, but because by the act of seeing the grace in something, by the act of eucharisteo, it opens, it opens up our eyes to the reality of God's sustaining presence, with it, which is with us at all times and in all circumstances. So where can you spy the grace in your life right now? Let me say that uh, there were things in our lives, I know, that were grace and were blessings to us at the time, but maybe we took them for granted, and now we feel the pain of the loss of them during this time of pandem pandemic. Uh, but, you know, we can still give thanks for them in the hopes that they will be restored to us. But even in this difficult time, there is still much for us to be grateful for. Uh, we can be grateful for our family. We can be grateful for our healthcare workers, our teachers, our jobs. We can be thankful for the technology that allows us to continue to connect to each other in this way. I mean, 20, 25 years ago, this wouldn't even be possible. So we have much to be grateful for if we train our eyes and our hearts to practice the art of Eucharisteo. And this coming Sunday, as some of you drive into the parking lot for service, I'll look at each one of you and I'll give thanks because I will see the grace that each one of you have been to me in my life. I will look around me and I'll think, this is my church family. These are my friends. These are the people that I will stand with and who will stand with me in any and all circumstances. Grace is there for it's all around me and it's all around you. Look for it. 
because I'm sure that it's not far. Let's pray together. Father, in these difficult times, there is still much for us to be thankful for. This is not to say that uh, we shouldn't grieve at times or that we shouldn't be sad, but that overall, Lord, that our lives should be one in which we look for the grace that is in things, because that is what will sustain us, Lord. Of all things, Lord, no matter where we find ourselves, you are there with us in the midst of even our most difficult times. And that is the thing that maybe we should be most thankful for. But we find it in different ways, Lord. So help us to look for them, to see the grace that's all around us in things that sometimes we don't always see. Lord, uh, we're thankful for your presence in our lives. We pray that you'll continue to sustain us, Lord, during these times. Thank you, Father. We thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, thank you for listening. Uh, I do hope that I'll see some of you this coming Sunday for our second in-person service. Uh, but until then, take care and God bless.